you like a cup of tea? I'll have a cup of tea. All right, let's do that. There you go. Do you want this one? I'll have your one. Yeah, my one. Thanks, mate. Cool. Having a cup of tea with Xavier Rudd on Friday night. Who would have thought? Uh, and uh, I've been checking you out. Obviously, I've known your music for a while, but when I knew I was going to be interviewing you, I thought, I get a sense of who you are and where you're at and what you're about, but I kind of got into Xavier consciousness, just really listening to your music but feeling your music yeah. and what it is that you're really bringing through. Mm. Um, and it's powerful, man, like, yeah, and beautiful. You, and so you come across to me as someone who's a very deep thinker. Would that be right? Um, I probably can be. Like, I think we, we probably all can be. Mm. But um, I think more a deep feeler, you know. I've always been yeah. pretty sensitive mm. to spirit and to, to what I feel. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I operate pretty much from that place mm. and uh, let that lead me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. yeah, Shakespeare said that the earth has music for those that listen. So what I yeah. kind of, you know, do you feel like you're, a, you're, a, you're playing instruments, but do you feel yourself you're an instrument for the music? Definitely I'm a vessel for music. Ever since I was mm. a little boy, I've understood that I, I had an old woman with me. And uh, it wasn't that clear, really. I don't see her, or it's not a visual thing, but it's a, it's a strong feeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of my music comes from um, that old woman. I believe that to be possibly my great-grandmother or grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty certain now, you know, I'm 37, coming up now, and I've been asking myself and wondering about that for quite a long time. I'm pretty sure I've been sort of sent, catapulted on a pretty interesting journey to some pretty, pretty powerful places in, on the earth that have, uh, you know, have been part of that wisdom and part of that bigger picture, part of that story. And, um, you know, I do understand that that old woman's very powerful and a lot of times, I can't take responsibility for my music. I'm just a vessel for it. Yeah. And I'm very respectful of it. You know, I'm very, mm. um, uh, I try and separate my ego completely from my music. So mm. when the music comes through, especially if it's from that place, mm. it's quite clear to me now when it's from an emotional experience that, that's going on with me or whether it's coming from that other place. And when it's coming from that other place, which quite often is coming from country, coming from spirit. Um, I let that woman sing and I just hold space. Mm -hmm. I just try and be a strong warrior for that. And same way as I wouldn't tell my nana what to wear to church, I'd just take her to church. Mm -hmm. I don't tell my music what to do, I just let mm -hmm. it be what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting for me because, you know, quite often I, I stand outside of myself and, you know, I feel like it's got, it's, it, it is representative of my journey, but it's almost six months ahead sort of thing, you know, of, of me. Mm -hmm. um, so you're playing catch-up? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm playing catch-up or, or, or I'm being, led. Or, or I'm being uh, presented situations that I'll understand later, mm -hmm. but I have to go through that law mm -hmm. or that, that journey of, mm. of, of what those situations are, whether it's physical pain, emotion. Mm. Um, I'd been on a pretty interesting journey in the last five years, mm. which was all law, I think, leading up to this project in a way. What do you mean by that? Um, it was... When you use the word law. It was... felt like warrior business, you know? It was about mm. really going into the depths of, of myself um, and understanding... Uh, quite deep things that um, were tough, you know, it's tough. I, I've had a tough last five years, really. What was going on? Um, 
Well, first I had to let go of my kids. Um, you know, I, I went through a, a period where I still, I'm still with my boys, but I had, for a period of time, I had to learn, uh, I had to separate from them. And that was really strong, that was really hard. And that was part of uh, what I have to hold and what I have to understand. You know, I learned that. Um, that was the start of it, and then from there I was, uh, I went on this, this journey of going back to my childhood, you know, which, it, and, and learning to love myself and, and open up stuff that, you know, I'd probably buried a bit or I'd, I'd, I'd created you know, blockages, and I decided to open them up. And I uh, did that with a, a few different elders around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and um, through different ceremonies and then my own, uh, own stuff. And uh, I got to a point of, of, real calmness within myself and um, mm. another level of strength, you know. I probably thought mm. I was okay, but I, once I really opened those boxes, I, mm. I realised that, no, nah, I was... For someone like me who's carrying what I carry and doing the work that I do, I need to be strong, mm. you know. And uh, it was breaking me down mm. um, a little bit, you know, mm. and I wasn't seeing that properly. But now I'm, all, I'm able to hold myself um, spiritually a lot stronger um, and, 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 and protect myself mm -hmm. through that law, which made me, I think, ready to carry the story of this, this band, which is only the beginning, but I feel like it's, quite, it's going to be quite a powerful journey. So when you say the work that you're doing, what is that? Um, Carrying the spirit of that old woman, mm -hmm. and uh, and travelling with that around the world, and um, affecting people with that, and mm -hmm. opening things up in people, and um, talking to people about it, and. Um, watching change happen, watching environmental groups mm. start small and grow big as I come back around each year um, and I can be involved in things mm. through my, um, my public, um, uh, what do you call that, my, um, my public reach. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm. honor that magnet, be part, be a big part of that magnetic pull that's going mm. on yeah. between the earth and human beings. Mm. And it was a popular belief I noticed traveling around for, say, the last ten years. It was kind of like quite popular to say that there was a shift. But I didn't see it, you know. I was kind of like wondering about that. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, I feel like this last two years, mm -hmm. there really is a shift. Mm. There's something going on magnetically um, on the earth that is actually drawing human beings back. It's like our great mother is going, okay, I need to deal with these humans, mm. sort of thing. <laughs> and so we need to pull X amount of them back for whatever reason, and it, you know, it's hard to, we all can sit there till the cows come home and try and analyse that, but, you know, we don't really know, but we can feel it. And it's pretty exciting because, um, you know, we've very much been led astray through religious conditioning and domination, you know. We've lost our roots and, you know, we are of the earth. We're not just on the earth, we are mm. of the earth and people forget that. You know, we, 
we're, we're no different than a tree or a flower. We are of the earth and we have an energetic connection to the earth, but that connection can be blocked. Mm. And um, I think the earth, like all creation, is black and white. You know, if, 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 there's, if there's a disease and it cuts it off, it, it learns to become immune to it. And I think that's what's happened in a lot of human society is it's just a block. Mm. And um, to reopen that um, is, a, is a task, I think, but I feel like creation has, you know, I don't know if it's a conscious decision, but something's going on mm. where there's a where there's a pull, there's a magnetic pull. I'm noticing that. And it's pretty exciting, it's pretty interesting. It's exciting yeah. too, yeah. you know. It's, it's, um, it's been a lot of suffering in the human race. Yeah. So it's exciting to see creation open its arms. Yeah. Again, possibly, you know. Yeah. I'm not saying that all humans have been blocked, but mm. I think probably more than we think. Would it be fair to say that the work, the inner work that you're also doing is to really maintain that strong connection with country and with your people? Because I should now let you guys know, I, I just learned tonight actually, because I'd seen, you know, when you're in, when you're performing, you've got little Aboriginal flags on your clothing at different times. You've got your uh, guitar, which we'll see later, which is adorned in um, Indigenous art. But you're actually, you, you have a, a, a Aboriginal blood. Yeah, I'm my yeah. father. I'm a, yeah. So tell us like a, bit, a little dog. bit about that. Um, and did you always know that? And yeah, my father, yeah, I always knew that. Um, yeah. It wasn't something that was, that was discussed a lot in my family because my dad's family was a mess. And uh, yeah. he met my mum and she was from an Irish Catholic sort of family that her, her dad came from Holland um, and met my nana, who's Irish um, descent. And then they had this beautiful little family, six girls, and yeah. um, dad came from the other side of the tracks and uh, ended up coming in to that family with mum. Got mum pregnant, actually. And um, then... Uh, they ended up having seven boys, and I'm one of them. Wow. And, Where do you um, figure in the timeline? I'm the second eldest. <laughs> but, yeah, so Dad's family was... He, he, he actually said to us when I was a kid, when, when I was a kid, he used to say to us, my family starts with me. And he was totally... He didn't want to know about his family at all. Mm. So it's a touchy one, but, um, you know, the spirit of, I think... The spirit of my grandmother, my great grandmother, has definitely been with me, and ever since I was a boy, I've wanted to open that can, you know, mm. and understand that more. And when did that um, start to happen? How did that start to happen for you? Um, it was always there, mm. ever since I was, you know, in my dreaming, in in everything, and uh, I guess my musical path has been able to connect me more to country and to different mobs mm. around. Australia and overseas too, North America. Mm. But um, uh, I've always had a, a pretty clear understanding, I think, of country and spirit. You know, I can feel where I can and can't go. Mm -hmm. I'm quite perceptive of what's going on on the land. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in you know, our Aboriginal culture, that's our um, that's part of our dreaming. Our ancestors are with us to. To you know, remind us of those things, and I believe that happens with all bloodlines in this country. It doesn't, spirit doesn't um, determine, doesn't assess your bloodline before it passes through you. It just passes yeah. through you. Yeah. And so, the, the the ancient, powerful, magical, mystical Aboriginal spirit that exists in all parts of Australia passes through each and every one of us equally, yeah. and. It's just our cultural understanding, our education. Like, you know, some people might feel that and go, that's a beautiful view. Oh, this place feels amazing. I love it here. Let's have a picnic. Yeah. But quite often that might be a powerful 
spiritual exchange that's going on between, you know, and if, if our government installed a system back in the day that was equal and all bloodlines in this country were able to grow with um, Indigenous education as well, which is what should be going on with our kids, then there'd be a deeper understanding of, of land here. Mm. Um, and that can be used by everyone. For some reason, they, there's a massive constipation in Australia with, um, you know, with shame, with, mm. you know, most white people want to, you know, they have a good heart and they want to see, mm. they want to see change here. They want to, they want to understand Blackfellas, they want to understand that path, but um, there's been a, 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 a blanket of shame that's been thrown over our country that makes people not want to talk about it, mm. you know, like, don't know what to do, don't know what to say, don't yeah. know what to do, yeah. and go about our days. Mm. Um, that really frustrates me, mm. it really does, and I sing a lot about that because um, not only do I feel for the oppression of Indigenous people, I feel for the oppression of white people, of all people, of all bloodlines yeah. in this country because it's a fucked up system yeah. in terms of the reconciliation with our Aboriginal people. Yeah. It's horrible. I've never seen anything so bad. I've done a lot of travelling and I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. And this closing of communities, that guy up there in Western Australia, Colin Barnett, He's an absolute cowboy. He is, he is a racist, um, money-hungry, ignorant prick. Mm. And, I've, and I say that from first-hand experience with him. Mm. Um, and What's going on there? Well, he's closing communities in WA. For what and which he's been doing, you know, based on mining as well, you know. Like, they've been doing that for a long time. It's like... It's become a media thing about the closing of communities because it's quite blatant. But that's been going on for 200 years, yeah. you know, and people have been shifted around and, and you know, and wrongly dealt with forever. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he was the guy behind uh, the, the James Price Point um, thing that we were able to stop. You know, it's part of that campaign, which is yeah, out. Um, and uh, I was up there once in, um, sorry to be aggressive with my language too about him, but you know, I don't really find, <laughs> uh, there's no other word. I mean, he's a prick. Um, like, he, he really is. The sheer sure fits. Um, yeah, because you know, I, you know, I saw it firsthand. He, I was in the Bardi community, and he had come to talk to Aboriginal people about um, about this, this this gas operation that he wanted to do. And so, what he'd said was, "I'm going to have lunch with the local mob." And he came in. All the people from the community had come out to the to the place where it was held, this hall, and um, there was lunch on the table, sandwiches and stuff on the table, and it was a really hot day, and I was there with another couple of people, and um, there's flies buzzing all around the sandwiches, no one was allowed to eat anything waiting for Colin Barnett to come, the Premier, and uh, he comes two hours late, comes in, and all the old people, you know, like they can't, you know, it was pretty, pretty, pretty yeah. weird. He comes, two hours late, four or five four-wheel drives turn up, suits get out, they all walk into this thing, Colin Barnett comes in, doesn't address anyone, just comes up, gives his speech about how the, the, the gas operation is going to, you know, make life better in the communities. Da da da, his big sales pitch. And then, question time, um, his answers were quite vague with people. And then I asked him, I went to ask him a question, and he looked at me, and then 
said, uh, oh, it's only for questions are only for locals. And uh, I said, okay. And then I was st still standing there with my hand up going. And then one of the local mobs said, let that fella speak. And then so I said, I asked him, Colin, so this country that this thousands and thousands of hectares of land that you're about to totally change forever and suck all the resources out of. Um, do you know the story of that land? Have you bothered to, to understand the story of that? Because that story, that's thousands of years old. Do you know about that? And he said, his answer was, how would I know about that? I'm not Aboriginal. That was his answer. And I said, so this is not long after the Prime Minister of our country has apologised to Aboriginal people and you, as the Premier of one of the five states, is prepared to change this piece of sacred land forever that's important to all these people and you haven't bothered to sit down and understand the story of it. And then the police came over and told me that that was enough, I wasn't allowed to speak anymore. And then he uh, didn't take any more questions, left, didn't have lunch with anyone, so then left and then everyone was going allowed to go and grab a fly-blown sandwich. <laughs> and um, he drove off. Then there was a big thing in the papers that he'd had, he'd had lunch with the community and, you know, had photos of him and just they just portrayed this whole other thing. And his, like I was able to look at the zoning, but his, he, the, what they've got, what his ideas of dicing up the Kimberley, one of the last great wildernesses on the planet, um, no recorded extinctions, you know, something that the whole world needs to protect. It's not just Australia. It's, it's, it's a, a very important part of our earth. Um, he's got, a, you know, he basically wants to cut the whole thing up for the whole different resources. So he's, he's a real problem. And I believe that um, this closing communities now is, is part of that. Mm. It's, all, it's all part of a bigger picture later on what, with, what they're going to do with that land thing. And that has to change in this country, you know. And I quite often wonder, you know, how do we actually change it? Like, we, the power of the people is pretty strong. And, you know, we saw that in the, in the James Price Point campaign. We were, you know, it started as a small group of people and, and, it, and it stopped the biggest gas operation Australia's ever seen, one of the biggest environmental victories our world's ever seen. Um, and, it, yeah, it, it made me feel like, OK, we can do it, but we have to be more strategic. You know, there's too much division in human culture. For some reason, that's part of our makeup. There's always division, and even in environmental groups, there's a lot of division. You know, there's this group's doing this over here, it's great. This group's doing this over here, it's great. They don't really know what that group's doing, they don't really know what that group's doing, but it's all good, good work, and everyone's patting everyone on the back for the good work. But if we actually looked at the conscious movement of people around the world, it's, it's massive, it's huge. And if we were able to link together and focus on one thing as all conscious people, and we have the ability through the internet to do that communication, um, it would be massive. So if the whole conscious movement around our world went right, this month it's the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, or this month it's Amazon, or you know, and we actually all went at a government with worldwide support, it would be huge. It would be massively impactful. So that's kind of what I've, that's kind of what I see. And I think that also quite possibly in Australia we need to start a new political party, um, a new fresh one, you know. Power. Yeah, I think, I, I do, I think that it needs to be fought at a political level and I think that um, we do have, you know, uh, if we set up 
I've been talking to Mark Jones about it, who's the, and we've got this idea, but he's, he was the head of Save the Kimberley, he's an amazing man. Um, he was um, Malcolm Douglas's cameraman for many years and he's quite politically minded and he fought hard in the James Price Point campaign and he was, he was a great warrior for that. And now he's, he's trying to get the Kimberley World Heritage listed, which is about a 10 year project he sees. But he's got Robert Redford involved and he's got some big investors from overseas and he's a real mover and shaker. But, you know, with uh, his input, with, sorry, with us joining forces around our country, there's a lot of conscious people. There could, we could start a political party that's less predictable than the Greens mm -hmm. and that's something new and fresh um, for people to latch on to. And, you know, something like that, ha I think, has to happen in this country because, you know, we've got some, we've got some big problems yeah. in this country. And one of them that you were talking about earlier is how white people who carry guilt, and I'm one of them, mm. for what happened to your people long mm. before I came, mm. and I don't know how to reconcile. I don't really know how to make amends for all those wrongs that were done to a people that existed on this continent for 50,000 years, the oldest living civilization. Yeah. So how do we go about the process of that healing? But now we're, we're one people. Yeah. It's not about whose people were whose people. It's one people now, you know. And yeah. we've become a, a, a beautiful society. And Indigenous Australia blends beautifully into society now. Yeah. And that pride is still there. But the oppression still exists because there's never been any respect. And it's quite simple. The, you know, Uncle Tio, who plays bass with us, from South Africa. He's from South Africa. Yeah. He's Southern Sotho. He's 58 and man, suffered yeah. heavy apartheid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, went through un unspeakable shit. And he, you know, I've lived and travelled with him for quite a few years now. And the interesting thing is, is just that pride that came with the rise up of Mandela. Mm you know, it, it just installed a pride. And he says he can forgive, but he can never forget. And he lives without any judgment or any anger or any bitterness. Mm -hmm. He's the most humble, beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that is what's lacking in our, in, our, mm -hmm. in our Aboriginal society in Australia, is that everyone's walking like this. Yeah. You know, everyone's got that oppression, you know, that, that shame, that, mm. that thing that's never been lifted. And if our, our government just started to celebrate Aboriginal culture mm. as a special part of our country and a mm. very special part of everything um, that happens in this country, which is, we're seeing sort of sometimes, you know, mm. and it's good, it's, it's growing, but... Yeah. Um, all people need to feel is that pride. Mm. They just need to feel that respect. Mm. To be our kids need to feel proud of their culture, not not oh I'm the I'm the black kid in the corner, or oh, you know, mm. none of these other fellas know anything about my culture. Mm. You know, oh you know, and all that shit happened and oh 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 oh, yeah. oh you know. Mm. But oh yeah. yeah. I'm one of the you know, I'm a bloodline from from one of the most beautiful and ancient cultures. Yeah. In our, on our earth, mm. and I feel so proud of that, yeah. and my country celebrates that. Yeah. I feel real special. <laughs> That's all it needs to be. Yeah. And then all of that shame that exists mm. within white people, black people, <laughs> yellow people, red people, purple people, blue people, who cares? Mm. That can all just be <sighs> yeah. let go of, you know? And we can go, oh, you know, mm. all right, that happened, but we're here now. Mm. And let's celebrate each other, let's love each other, yeah. you know, let's boost each other up, let's mm. not push each other down. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I spent some time a little bit with a guy from the uh,
was um, in the presence of the guy that founded Organic India, Bharat, and um, he, he said, Gary, I'm no less indigenous than these people, you know, all these mm. Aboriginal elders around him, just because of the colour of my skin. Mm. So we're all indigenous, so that's really what you're telling yeah, us. Yeah, we're about. all of the earth. Yeah. And we don't need to feel guilt and shame. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm mostly white blood, you know, I understand that concept, but we don't need to feel that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's conditioning. Mm. That doesn't exist, yeah. really, in our natural makeup. Mm. You know, we are all of the earth. We are all equal. We are all clean, pure beings if we can take this away. Yeah. If we can let that mind just stop for a second and look at ourselves outside of our ego, mm. then it's quite simple. It's not that involved. Mm. And that, you know, that domination, that shame, that guilt, all of that stuff that we carry that grinds us down and has for, for centuries mm. um, doesn't need to be there, you know. It's not our fault. It's not anybody's fault, mm. the struggle, you know. Mm. But, but it's about letting go of all of that, all of us, and, and learning to love each other and learning to embrace each other and learning to walk up to Indigenous people and go, how are you going? I'm a white fellow in this country. I don't know anything about yeah. your culture. I wish I was taught about it. Yeah. I definitely feel it and I love what you guys mm. do. And um, can you tell me a few things? Mm. Can you meet my kids? <laughs> like, can I, can, can I go up and like meet, do you know an auntie or someone that I can talk to, that, an elder that I can talk to about, because like, I'd like to know something about where I grew up. Da, 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 you know? Like if people need to start to do that, start to let go of, of that yeah. barrier and that in itself without our government you know our government can be what they want but that in itself can instill pride mm. in in an oppressed person in indigenous people you know yeah. they, they feel great about that yeah you know? beautiful yeah. Yeah. so this um thing that you've created the united nations seems to be the embodiment of that whole idea isn't it Bringing yeah, together it is. all the diversity. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, um, I think I've been, you know, it's been time, like I said, I went through that law and I think, you know, there's all the members in this band, it's, it's like, you know, yes, I did put it together, but no, I didn't really, because I feel like everybody that presented, there was no auditions or anything, it was the right person was sent. Mm. So everyone that plays in this band is equal mm. and everyone was sent for a reason that we probably don't understand. And everyone comes from a different culture and a different background. Mm. So it feels like our ancestors had a cup of tea and went, right, let's put all this mob together <laughs> and, let's, and let's create this music, which is roots reggae music based, but it's not, it's, it's different than you know, it's its own sound. Mm. And um, we played our first show in Melbourne last night. Yeah, right. It was deadly. <laughs> and uh, we play Sydney tomorrow night and we, uh, we had a few shows in Australia and then we, we, it's America and Europe and, you know, mm. it's going to be a powerful journey. We're going to be travelling with, you know, a lot of spirit It's going to be moving mm. with us. And I think, well, you know, the music's the music and the... the, the the opportunity for people to shake it off and dance and boogie and all that happens at the show. But I think there's probably, there's going to be waves, ripples that come for, for, for time after that and, and, and we'll understand a little bit more about what the bigger picture of this project is. Mm. And give thanks every day, you know. Yeah. And give thanks every day, give thanks. Mm -hmm. And who do you give thanks to? Creation. <laughs> Put it together. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for coming, man. It's so beautiful to have you here.